Hi everyone, welcome back to Art of the Part. In this video, I'm going to show you how to set up a complex first operation program in Mastercam using the SoftRiser A-1 that we just finished up here inside SolidWorks. Now, we have this 3D model of that SoftRiser A-1 open inside SolidWorks, and this top side that we're currently looking at, this is actually the second operation program. And you'll notice that there's a lot of details here, and we probably won't be able to hold on to this in the vise, especially since we have like these cylindrical surfaces. So I'll spend another video looking at second operation uh, and how to program that. However, in this video, I'm going to talk about the backside, which is going to be nice and flat. We can hold it in the vise. This is going to be first operation. And if we make this side nice and flat and we can hold it in the vise, we can ensure that both sides are parallel to each other. Now, we also have some details in here that we're going to talk about in Mastercam that I don't have inside SolidWorks, which is going to include some text here on the backside as well as some edge breaks. So now that we've kind of explained the part, I'm going to open this inside of Mastercam and start programming it. So I already have a session of Mastercam open, and I'm going to open that down here. And I'm going to explain what we're looking at here inside of Mastercam in just a second. However, one of the most important things that I want you to check is just to make sure that you're in the right current units of measurement. And we're going to go up here to the top left where it says File and click on that file. And we're just going to go down here to the Configurations tab. And inside of Configurations, it's going to open up this System Configuration window. And by default, in a lot of computers and a lot of times when you start Mastercam for the first time, it might have metric or uh, millimeters set here for your units of measurement as well as your current system configuration file uh, which could also be set to metric. Now when you have this current configuration file set to metric this is actually going to force all of the units of measurement inside of your master cam session to metric as well as all the available tools set to metric as well. You could probably see that could turn into a problem if you're working in an inch part and you set up your wireframe, your stock, and then you start to get to your programming of the toolpath and then you realize that the only available tools that you have are metric tools. So again, just make sure that you have this set to inch an inch or you could end up in a little bit of a bind and you're going to have to kind of scale things down which is just a pain in the butt. So set this to inch, set this to inch, and then we'll hit the green check mark. All right, so I'm going to talk about what we're looking at here inside of Mastercam. Just like inside SolidWorks, we have a viewport here where all of our 2D and 3D geometry is going to be housed. Over on the left-hand side, uh, we're typically used to seeing that feature tree. However, now this is going to be the operations manager. All of our toolpath geometry and the way that we can change it is going to be over here on the left-hand side. And then up here, this top ribbon, we have our home, wireframe, so on and so forth. Uh, just go down here to view. And inside this view tab, I just want to make sure that you currently have toolpaths, planes, and levels active. Now, if you ever get in a situation where you're looking at this toolpaths tab and you actually like accidentally click it out of it, um, it will actually remove it or undock it from this do uh, bottom tab down here. So you might have to come back here into the view and then click on toolpaths and that will redock it over here in this bottom tab. Likewise, if you wanted to turn on your axes where you can locate your origin, you can show axes up here. However, I'll show you a quick way how to turn that on or toggle it on and off uh, without coming here to the view tab. So I'll go over there, I'll come back to this home screen. And now that I've had everything set up, I can go ahead and import a 3D model from SolidWorks. So I'm gonna come back up here to my file uh, go up to file and then I'm going to click on open and then I already have files open here that I've been working on however you can go to computer and we can look for where our soft riser a-1 is located and by default Mastercam might only be looking for Mastercam files so you might not be able to see your SOLIDWORKS file off the bat however down here in the bottom right hand corner you can actually search for and hit the drop down menu for Mastercam files and scroll down until you see all files and this will actually direct you to all files in that folder, and we can actually locate that SoftRiser A-1. The SolidWorks file, we can see that the type is SolidWorks, as well as the icon for SolidWorks, which is that yellow Tetris piece. So I'll click on that SolidWorks A-1, hit open, and this is going to import the 3D model into our session of Mastercam. Now, this might be a little confusing coming from a different CAD software like SOLIDWORKS into a different CAM software like Mastercam because the views could be a little bit shifted. And that really has to do with who the parent company is, where their country of origin is located, because they might have a specific uh, angle of projection for that country, like first angle projection versus third angle projection. And inside SOLIDWORKS, if I wanted to check where my top view was, I'd hit the space button, and then it would open up my orientation tab, and I can choose the front view. 
Now here inside Mastercam, if I have to open up that orientation tab, I have to right click anywhere in this view uh, port. So I'm gonna right click up here and I can see that I have my top, front and right view. So let's go ahead and try and orientate ourselves to the top view. So I'm gonna click on top and if you open up this part from Master, or sorry, from SolidWorks into Mastercam, you'll notice that nothing changed. And that's because, again, those views have been slightly shifted. So what we need to do is rotate our top view so that we're not looking at the top here because this is a second operation, but to actually go down here to the bottom for first operation. And the way that we're going to do this is on the bottom left-hand corner, we can see that we have toolpaths, solids, planes, and levels. We're going to locate that planes tab. And inside this planes tab, we can see that we have all of our different views and that we have a gnomon, and I'll click on the top view again here, uh, that has Z pointing away, um, Y going that way, and then X going to the right. Now, what I want to do is rotate this so that Z is pointing towards us, uh, and we're going to rotate around the X axis. So the easiest way to do this is up here in the top left-hand corner of the planes, we're going to hit the drop-down menu here for this uh, plus button. So I'll click on that plus button, and then I'm going to open up this dynamic option from this drop-down menu. So again, planes tab, green plus button, and then from that drop-down menu, we're going to select dynamic. So we're going to click on this dynamic option, and you'll notice that when you pull your mouse out into the viewport, we actually have a gnomon that is uh, located on top of our mouse that's pointing X, Y, and Z axes. Now, as I said before, if you wanted to locate where the origin of the part is, because right now we're just kind of fishing, if you have it memorized and you remember from SolidWorks, like, yeah, I drew the origin at the bottom here, uh, I can try to fish for it and snap and locate to it. Uh, however, we currently don't see that. So you could go up here in this top tab here and go to View, and you can turn on your axes from this button right here. However, if you wanted to get used to some of these hotkeys, the easy way to toggle this on and off is just to hit F9 on your keyboard. So I'll click on F9. It'll actually turn on these axes here, and I can actually see where the origin of this part is located. So it's right down here at the bottom in the center, and I can move my mouse over to it, and I can click on it, and it'll snap, and I'll have this link to that origin. However, my axes are still a little bit off. Z is still pointing up. Y is going away. X is going to the right. We actually want to move this so that Z is pointing along this axis or pointing towards us. So what we need to do, and if you use your three-finger rule, if you have your X, Y, and Z, I want to rotate around X so that Z is pointing towards me. So the way that I can rotate around X, you have all these little stems, different colors, and then these little segments as well. So the X stem is colored red, so the corresponding uh, X segment that I can rotate around is are these red segments right here. So click on any one of these three red segments, and when I click on them, it'll open up this little like compass or this little wheel. And as you move inside this wheel in your mouse, you'll notice that if you're inside the compass, this is going to go in five degree increments. However, if you're outside of the compass, it's just going to go to wherever you click. So this could be 49.45, this could be 86.67, so they're not exact measurements. So my advice to you, when you change the uh, angle here or rotate it, you want to make sure that you're inside the compass and that you're going to this 5 degree increment of 90 degrees, that we're you know, flipping exactly parallel or perpendicular to what our view is. So I'm just going to drop this or click this on the 90 degrees. We can see that Z again is pointing towards us, Y is going up, X is going to the, left, uh, to the right, and then we're going to rename this plane over here in the top left hand corner, and we're just going to name this First Op Top. And we'll go ahead and hit the uh, green check mark. So once we hit the green check mark, it's going to bring us back here to the Planes tab, and we can see from the left hand side that the WCS or the working coordinate system is still currently linked to the original top plane. Now this is going to cause problems because when I right click out here in the viewport and I hit top, it's still going to link me back to that original top view or in theory from SolidWorks the front view. So we're going to have to find our first op top and this is going to work a lot like uh, Excel where we have rows and columns. And in the first op top row, we're going to change the WCS or the work, working coordinate system to link to the first op top. So I'm going to click on the WCS in this column here. And we can see that the gnomon has shifted from up here uh, to over here. And then the C and the T plane, which is our construction as well as our tool plane, has to be linked to that first op top as well. 
So we, we relink the WCS, and then we're going to relink the C and the T in one click. So we have WCS, C and T all linked to the first op top. So in theory, now when I right click out here in the viewport and I hit top, it's going to reorientate myself to the first op top view, which is exactly what we need to do for the next stages of our programming. It looks like my C and my T fell off that, and I'm just going to relink that here to the C and T of the first op top. All right, so now that we have our plane set up and we have our views set up, we're going to create a new level to represent our stock material that we're going to cut away uh, for this model. So I'm going to jump over here from the planes tab in the bottom left, and we're going to go over to the levels tab. So inside of levels, we can see that we currently have a level for cut extrude or this solid that we imported. And just like what we did for the planes, we're going to add a new level uh, using this green plus button at the top left hand corner of the levels tab. So I'm going to click on the plus button once. I'm going to add one new level. You can see that the check mark has moved from the uh, original body or the 3D model to the second level. And I don't have a name and I don't have any entities currently linked to it. So for the name here, I'm just going to double click here on this little column or row and I'm going to name this wireframe. And then again, we can currently see that we have zero entities linked to it. And while I'm here, I just want to show you how you can toggle um, the visibility of certain levels. So as long as you have a check mark linked to this wireframe, I can actually hit this visible X uh, for the first level, which is going to be the 3D model. And I can turn it on or turn it off. And if I wanted to turn off this wireframe, I would have to then move off of that level. So I'd have to move the check mark next to the first level, and I could turn the wireframe on or off from there. Um, just make sure that you're currently set or the check mark is next to the wireframe level because we want to add entities to that level and not add entities to the 3D solid model. All right, so we're going to move from this view tab in this top ribbon all the way over here to the left in the wireframe tab. So click on the wireframe tab. And this allows us to create 2D geometry. And there's a whole bunch of different options that we can choose from. But I want you to find this bounding box uh, feature. So using the bounding box feature, we're going to click on this. And it's going to allow us to create the stock model extents uh, for the raw material that we need to use to cut this uh, final part out of. So once we have a uh, bounding box selected, it's asking us, uh, what do we want to use as reference to create this 2D geometry? So I'm going to select on this 3D model. And then once I have that 3D model selected, if I move my mouse off of it, you can see that it's highlighted in yellow. So this is the only component that I want to be selecting. And I'm going to hit the end selection. And once we hit end selection, we can see that I'll zoom out here a little bit. We've created a perfect cube around the extents of our part. And this is going to match exactly in X, Y, and Z. We can see that X is 2.875, Y is 2.875, and Z, the height, is going to be 0.96875. Now, I want to add some material because we want to have some cleanup from that stock size. So this needs to be a little bit bigger than our finish here uh, for the 3D model. So over here on the left-hand side, I just want you to make sure that your rectangular settings are currently set to the center origin. Um, it might be at the top or the bottom by default. And if you start to add material from the top or the bottom, it's only going to go in one direction. So I want to select here from the center of my origin so that when I add in Z and X and Y, that I'm going equally in uh, every direction. So we're going to change the um, origin here to the center. And then our size extents in X are going to be 3.75. And then in Y, we're going to make this 3. And in Z, we're going to make this 1. So again, we're at the center, or the origin here of the part, and then we're going to add to 3.75, 3, and then 1. And then we'll hit the green check mark, and we can see that from the Levels tab, it's going to bring us back out here. We currently have 12 entities linked to that wireframe. And we have these 12 lines that are going to represent the cube or the extents of our stock material. So now that we've set up our levels as well as our planes, I feel comfortable moving forward and creating some toolpath geometry. So down here in the bottom left, you can see that we are working in the levels tab as well as the planes tab. But we're going to hop over here and just click on this toolpaths tab at the way bottom left. So click on toolpaths, and this is going to open up our operations manager. And you'll notice that the operations manager is currently empty, and that's because we haven't created any toolpath geometry. Additionally, Mastercam needs to know what machine that we're working with before it can offer us toolpath options to choose from. So up here in the top left, you can see that we're in the wireframe tab. We're going to go all the way over here to the right to get to the machine tab. So once you click on the machine tab, 
you'll see that MasterCam is going to offer you some options to choose from a mill, a lathe, a wire EDM, a router, so on and so forth. And in this exercise, we're just going to use a standard mill and we're just going to do standard three axis operations. So click on the mill and it's going to open up this drop down menu and we're going to select the default option. And you'll notice a couple things. First, we move from the Machine tab to the Toolpaths tab, and this is going to house all of the different toolpath geometry that we can choose from. So 2D geometry, 3D geometry, and then multi-axis geometry. Likewise, in our Operations Manager, you can see that we populated a machine group, and this is going to be the current machine that we're working in. And if you're going from like first operation to second operation, you just want to make sure you're staying in that same machine group. However, if you're going from like a lathe to a mill, you'll have to create multiple machine groups. And beneath Machine Group, we have this Properties tab with this little piece of paper. Uh, I always like to open this up, and I'll talk about this later, but when you open or expand that up with the plus button, you can see Files, Tool Settings, and then Stock Setup. And right beneath that, we have our Toolpath Group 1. And inside of Toolpath Group 1, this is going to house all of our 2D, 3D, and multi-axis geometry for that specific operation. So for example, if you're going from first operation to second operation, you're going to want to keep those two programs separate. So what you'll need to do is create an additional Toolpath Group. So everything in Toolpath Group 1 is for first operation, and everything in Toolpath Group 2 is for second operation. Additionally, if you're going from one machine to another, so like a lathe to a mill, or from a mill to a secondary mill, you'll have to create an additional machine group so you can keep those two separate, uh, so you can establish its own own tool library and stock material. And speaking of stock material, let's go ahead and create the stock material for this 3-axis mill. And you'll have to go underneath your Properties tab and find your stock setup. And if you don't currently see that, you'll have to expand out this Properties. Again, it's that piece of paper with the plus button next to it. Expand that out and we can find stock setup. Double click on stock setup and it's going to open up our machine group setup and we can go ahead and set up our stock material from here. And the reason why we have to set up stock material is so that we can verify our simulation of the toolpath so we can see material get removed from that stock. Right now we just have 2D wireframe and we can create toolpath from that. However, we won't be able to see that dynamic removal of material uh, from the simulation. So inside a stock setup, we are going to go through a couple options here. By default, you might have this preview setting for the show wireframe off, and that's going to be linked to that wireframe we created from the levels earlier. However, you can toggle it on or off from the preview settings here and click on show wireframe entities. Additionally, we want to make sure that we're driving this stock setup from the right plane. So we're going to click on stock plane uh, transformation. And inside of here, it's by default set to the original top plane. So what you'll need to do is link it back to the new top that we set up earlier so that our X, Y, and Z matches up. So you're going to hit the drop down menu here for top. And then you're going to go all the way down here and find our new plane for first op top. And then once you have your wireframe shown and your first op top selected, we're going to go over here to our familiar face, which is going to be Add from Bounding Box. So we used this earlier for the wireframe geometry. And we click on Add from Bounding Box. We're going to be welcomed with this Bounding Box uh, Properties tab. And we could go through this, you know, do the same thing where we choose the origin. We can set up our X, Y, and Z. However, we already have that geometry set up from the wireframe earlier. So what we need to do is just go over here to All Shown. So that's right beneath Manual. So we're going to click on All Shown. And it's going to recognize that stock material from the wireframe, and it's going to create this nice bounding box for us uh, going to our X, Y, and Z extents. And once you see this, we're going to hit the green check mark. We'll see that we have a nice uh, stock material here represented in red. This is going to be the mesh file that will be referenced for that verify simulation. And we'll hit the green check mark once again. And that's going to complete the stock setup. However, we don't currently see the stock setup on our screen. By default, it's toggled off. And if you want to see that, you can go up here into the Toolpaths tab, and underneath Stock, you can find Stock Display. If you click on Stock Display, you'll see, actually see the red line extents of that Stock Display. Additionally, if you want to see the Stock Display as like a full mesh file, you can click on the Stock Shading, and you can get the opaque uh, view here. I don't necessarily like working with this on. It's kind of hard to click through some of these entities, so I, by default, will turn this off. But I do like keeping the Stock Display on because I like seeing the extents there. So now that we have our stock material set up, let's go ahead and create a face mill to remove material from the top face. So up here in the top left, we can see that we have the 2D, 3D, and multi-axis toolpaths. And we're going to only focus on the 2D toolpaths here for this video. And I can show you that we have a whole bunch of options to choose from. It's not just contour, drill, dynamic mill, and face. There's this arrow right here to expand this gallery out. 
and we can see that we have a whole array of milling options as well as hole making options. So we're going to look at this fourth icon for face, so we'll select on that, and this is going to open up our chaining window. And we have the ability to choose from wireframe or solid geometry. And by default, it might pull you here into the solid geometry and you move your mouse over this model. You will notice that you can only select the model and not that wireframe uh, geometry we created earlier. So go ahead and select on the wireframe here. And it's going to be the see-through box. And we want to make sure that we only have the chain icon selected. So you could have window or any one of these other things selected. So only have chain selected. And this is why it's important for us to create wireframe geometry on a separate level, because if we went and created our stock display and we only had this red line here, we wouldn't be able to choose on it because that's a mesh file. We actually want to be picking up like vector files or vector lines. So click on one of these top edges here and make sure that you're not accidentally clicking on one of these side or bottom edges because your face mill will react accordingly. And then the green arrow is going to tell you what direction that toolpath is going. And then the red arrow allows you to continue that selection. So we'll click on this red arrow here. We can see that this line got highlighted in yellow and this line got highlighted in yellow. And we can go ahead and keep clicking on that red arrow. However, if you don't want to click on this red arrow every time that it moves, there's an option here in the chaining window for end point forward. It's like a little red fast forward button. So if you click on this, it's going to continue the red line selection or the red arrow selection. So we'll keep selecting this until the entire top face here is selected here in yellow. Because I'm telling the face mill the extents of the cut, and I want to remove this entire area. So we'll hit the green check mark after everything is selected there in yellow. It's going to open up our parameters or our toolpaths page. Now this window is going to operate a lot like having a conversation with Mastercam. As we go through each one of these tabs, we're filling out criteria so that Mastercam can write our lines of G-code for us to eventually get to a final toolpath. So make sure that you fill out everything basically up to the linking parameters, and then we can hit the green check mark and then go forward from there. So we're going to jump down here to the tool tab. Inside the tool tab, you'll notice that there are no tools currently active in our tool library. And we'll have to select from our tool library uh, to populate this for this specific tool path. So we'll click on the select tool library. Uh, one thing I want to note, if you're using the default three axis mill, the default tool library for that is going to have 446 tools, which is quite a lot. Um, you'll probably have to start filtering things out. And Mastercam is smart enough to know that we're trying to do a face mill. We're probably going to be picking from these face mills here. Uh, but if you have all 446 tools active, so I'm going to show you a bad example. I'm going to deselect my filter active here. You can see that if we have everything from drills all the way up to like chamfers and face mills, end mills, ball mills, so on and so forth. Uh, so you'll have to click on this filter here. And by default, it might have everything selected or nothing selected. Just hover your mouse over each one of these icons until you find the correct tool. So we're going to be using that face mill. So we'll click on face mill there and make sure that it's highlighted there in blue. We can hit the green check mark. And as long as we have the filter active, we can choose everything from our 2-inch face mill all the way up to our 10-inch face mill. So we'll select on that 3-inch face mill there. We'll hit the green check mark. It's going to pull that from the tool library, pull it into like the machine's tool library or the machine's magazine. And then we'll select on that 3-inch face mill. You can change your speeds and feeds here. I'm not going to talk about that here in this video. But I always recommend that my students will leave a comment for the tool that they're using. So I'm going to say that this is going to be the 3-inch face mill. And that way, when we complete this tool path, it will actually show or display the note over here in our operations manager. We'll jump down here into the holder. Um, you can select through some of these if you want. This isn't really going to be important because we're just using a default mill. Uh, we'll jump down here into our cut parameters. This allows us to choose the direction of the cut or the cutting method. So we can say we want to do zigzag, one way, one pass, dynamic. In this example, I'm just going to do the one pass. I think that's the easiest for new users to understand. Uh, and we're just going to take the entire three inch face mill and cut the entire width of this part, which is three inches. That's not necessarily great for the tool, but in this example, I think we'll just work just fine. Uh, stock to leave on the floor. We're going to select this and change this to zero. Later on, we'll come back and we'll actually adjust our approach and exit distance. But I want to complete this tool path and then we'll come back and I'll show you how to edit it later. Jump down here to our depth cuts. This allows you to make Z passes and control the depth of those Z passes. So select on the depth cuts here. We'll turn that on. And we're going to do a very light Z pass here. So we'll select the max rough step and we'll change it from 50 thousandths to 0.01. So we're only doing 10 thousandths. Again, very light. 
Uh, and again, we'll come back here and we'll make a change um, after we examine this in Backplot and Verify. So click on Linking Parameters next. Uh, if there's one thing that you remember from my explanation of this is to always just program an absolute. So change all these icons here to absolute, 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 and absolute. Uh, it's just the easiest way for us to understand the G-code because we're pulling from one single origin. We're not going from the last known point. I know incremental can be useful in certain instances, but for this example and for this lecture, I'm just going to keep telling you to do absolute, 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 and absolute. And as I said before, Mastercam is pretty smart. It can recognize where the top of stock is. So uh, this is about 15 thousandths above. And then we have a depth cut or a depth, final depth here of zero. And if you're not confident in these selections here, you can always click on the icon here for top of stock. And we get this uh, dynamic selection and I can click on certain points or edges. So I can click on the top corner here for the top of stock. I get verified there that I have 15 thousandths above and the depth is truly actually going to be zero if I click on one of those edges. Um, you can hit the green check mark now. I'm pretty confident that as we've gone through this, uh, you'll have a, a successful toolpath. But if you want to check uh, down here in planes, just make sure that you're always reading in like first stop top, first stop top, first stop top. If for whatever reason uh, this isn't reading in that plane that you created, you can either fast forward this and copy that tool plane, or sorry, co copy that plane to the next uh, iteration here, or you can click on this icon here for select tool plane, and it'll open up a window to select your different planes. Um, again, by default, this should still recognize, you know, first stop top, first stop top, first stop top. So you shouldn't have to make any changes. And then down here in our coolant, if you wanted to, you can turn on the flood so that when you post it, the coolant will turn on and do an M08 command. There are other values here that we can go through, but um, not really crucial to this specific toolpath. So we can hit the green check mark and we'll see that there are some lines of geometry being created out here in our viewport. Now, this might be a little bit difficult to see because we still have our axes turned on. So if you want to toggle that off, we can hit F9 on our keyboard. And I can see that I have my retract line here in yellow. And then if I keep zooming in, I actually see two tool paths. So we're going to make two paths because we set the depth of cut to 10 thousandths. And the entire uh, depth of material that we needed to remove was about 15 thousandths. So let's go ahead and try and simulate this. I'm going to zoom out a little bit. We're really going to lose the definition of those two lines. However, this will be helpful uh, to see the tool move along uh, the actual tool path. So over here in the Operations Manager, there's an icon that's called Backplot. It's these four little waves. Go ahead and click on that. And you'll see that the tool, and I'll zoom out again, kind of shift this over. The tool is out here uh, in our viewport. And if I hit the Play button, I can actually see it simulate or run across my part. And this will be good to see if the toolpath is operating the way that I want to. And as you see this play out, you'll notice that when it comes over here to the end of this cut, instead of moving down in Z, it actually retracts out, moves over the part, and then makes an additional cut. I think that this is a little bit of a waste of time, and we can try to optimize this. Additionally, uh, the entry and the exit motion is just way too long. So let's go ahead and back out a back plot here. I'm going to close out of this window. And I'm going to click on the parameters here right beneath that face mill that was created here in the operations manager. So that face mill is this operation. We're going to click on parameters. It's going to reopen that window, bring, a, bring us back to exactly where we left off. And I'm going to jump up here to my cut parameters uh, tab. So inside of cut parameters, let's go ahead and change our approach and exit distance. So right now it's set to 50%, so it's about one and a half inches entry and exit. That's a little much. Let's go ahead and change this to 25% and then 25%. And then if you wanted to, you could hit the green check mark and you'll see that the blue line kind of shrunk again. Now we still have this yellow retract line. Uh, we can jump back here into our parameters once again and we can move here from the cut parameters all the way down here to depth cuts. And there's just one little tick box that we can select here and that's keep tool down. So we'll select keep tool down, we'll hit the green check mark and we can see that that yellow retract mark has now been removed. So we shortened this here with one change in the parameters and then we also removed that retract out with an additional change in our parameters. So let's go ahead and have this selected again. We'll come up here to our back plot. Again, it's the icon with the four waves. We'll click on that. We'll hit the play button up here in the viewport and we can see that we're approaching a lot closer there. We're exiting a lot closer. And instead of moving up and over and restarting the cut, we're actually gonna move down in Z. We're gonna move down and then we're gonna go move back over. So that's a little bit more optimized cut in my opinion. Uh, I'm happy with that. 
and uh, we can hit the green check mark and we can continue on with our next tool path. We're going to do a contour mill that goes around the entire outside extents of this 3D model. So over here in the top left hand corner, we're going to select the contour mill from the 2D gallery here. We can either expand out this menu too, and we can find contour right there, or we can select directly from that top toolbar. So we'll select contour right there. By default, it's going to remember that we were trying to do wireframe chaining from that last known toolpath, which is going to be our face mill. Uh, so we're going to toggle from wireframe because we were only going to be able to select the outside edges of the stock material. And we're going to go over here to the solid chaining. So we're going to click on solid chaining there. And I'll show you a bad example really quick, but I don't know why by default it has this face mill turned on. I much prefer just to have the loops on. But when you have the face mill on and you accidentally select on this entire face here, you'll notice that it'll create additional tool paths for each one of these holes. And we obviously want to do that with a drilling operation and not with a end mill there. So I'm going to deselect this selection here. So if I have a bad selection, I can actually deselect it. So right here, there's this red circle with a cross through it. So we'll select unselect, so that's no longer selected. And then we're going to unselect the face mill or detoggle this. So I'll click on that. So we can only choose loops. And loops are going to work a lot like the wireframe chaining that we had in uh, the face mill, where we click on an edge. And instead of going from like, you know, like line to line to line to line, we're actually going to select the entire tangency loop here. And I'm going to move my part a little bit so it's a little bit easier to see this. But if I have only loop selected, make sure that you're selecting the entire outside edge of this part. And don't do like a face like this because it's going to go down. Um, we want this to go all the way around. So it'll be important where you click on this edge too uh, because it tells you what direction it's going to go, either clockwise or counterclockwise, which is going to start to um, feed into what the uh, you know climb milling or the conventional milling that you're doing or the G code that you're going to be running for G41 or G42. So we're going to go down here to the bottom edge of this line and we're going to select here and this will actually give us a nice clockwise climb cut. And if you didn't get that where it's going clockwise um, and you actually see the arrow and it's going counterclockwise, you can either deselect it or you can choose reverse. And if you choose reverse, you can actually toggle it between going clockwise or counterclockwise. We'll hit the green check mark as long as your arrow is going all the way around the top edge and it's going clockwise. We'll hit that green check mark. We'll get back here into our parameters or our toolpaths page. Uh, we're going to jump down here into our tools. We'll notice that we only have the three inch face mill in our, coolant, our current uh, tool magazine or library. And you could probably guess that we don't want to use that three inch face mill because it's going to be a little bit too big and we don't have the depth cut since you can only go so far down. So we're going to select from the tool library and we're going to open up the tool library again. Uh, Mastercam is smart enough to recognize that we want to use a flat end mill here for that contour selection. So we have a whole array of different tools that we can choose from. We're going to use the 5 8 flat end mill, so tool number 292. Hit the green check mark. Uh, that's going to populate that out here into our tool library or our magazine. We'll select that so that we're using it for this specific tool path. And then in the note here, we can type in 0.625 flat end mill and then we can put contour after it. We'll jump down here into holders. We don't have to make any changes there. We'll go into cut parameters. Um, this allows us to control the compensation direction. So this starts to apply if we're doing like an outside, like an island cut or an island detail or like an inside cut or a pocket cut. So we can do compensation direction for like left or right to control that. Um, if we wanna do like climb milling or conventional milling in either one of those. Uh, we can also control our compensation type. I'm not going to make any changes to anything in here, just kind of explaining some of the details. Uh, stock to leave on walls, we can change this or leave it here to zero and zero. And then the depth cuts will come down here. And we can just do two additional depth cuts and see if our practices kind of apply from what we learned inside the face mill. So we'll do depth cuts. Uh, I know that this shoulder is about like 375. So let's go ahead and split this and make it like maybe 0.25. Uh, so a quarter inch depth of cut, we'll go all the way down to a half inch here um, so that we're a little bit past that 375 shoulder. Uh, and then we're also going to make sure that we have the keep tool down selected so that we're not coming back up and retracting out. Lead in, lead out. This is very important. This is like our rolling in or rolling out of the specific cut. It allows chip thinning to occur, which is good. We want a nice thick 
to thin or sorry, thin to thick chip load, uh, and that we're not going to like ram the tool into the side of the part and then go directly up. I like using the example that we're driving a race car, and then if you're driving at like 200 miles per hour, you do not want to take a turn at 90 degrees. You're going to slowly slide into that cut or slowly slide into that turn. So always have your lead in and lead it out uh, turned on when applicable. Uh, breakthrough, we're not going to actually break through any parts here. Multi passes, don't need to worry about that. Tabs is fine. Down here in linking parameter, again, just remember we always want to have absolute, 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 and absolute selected. Top of stock, not really important in this specific example, but if we have a big piece of stock and we're making a bunch of cuts on that face mill, um, we don't want to accidentally go all the way to where that uh, stock material was set up originally. We've actually removed that with the stock, uh, sorry, with the face mill. So the top of stock is truly going to be zero. So we can either type in zero here or we can hit top of stock and select on this face because that's where we left off with the face mill beforehand. And the depth, we're going to click on depth. We're going to get an idea of how deep this shoulder is. As I said, I knew it was 375. Uh, and I'm just going to go a little bit below that, so I'm going to type in negative 0.5. So we're going an eighth inch below um, so that we have nice cleanup. So we went the depth of cut 250. When I hit the green check mark, we should see two passes going around this part. We'll hit the green check mark, and again, we can see those two passes going around the part. So let's take a look at our contour using backplot, like what we did for the face mill, to make sure that our toolpath operation is running the way that we want. So over here in our operations manager on the left hand side, we're going to go to the top of the window and look for those four little waves. This is going to be backplot selected operations. We'll go ahead and select on that. It's going to simulate the tool out here in our viewport and from the top left of the window, we'll go ahead and hit play. We can see that the tool is traveling around the 3D model. It's creating a pretty nice contour. However, I'm not sure if it's going to actually clean up in these corners for the stock model. So I'm going to show you a quick way that we can simulate that in backplot and get a greater appreciation for the true depth and width of each cut. And there's an icon called Simple Verify. So we'll click on Simple Verify and we'll see that each one of these tool paths are getting traced out in orange. And this is going to be the width of the tool. So from the top left, I'm going to go ahead and rewind this and play it once again. And we can see it come around each one of these corners. And I'm feeling pretty confident that we're going to clean up each one of these edges. Now, I want to take this one step further and actually see that material get removed. So I'm going to back out a back plot and I'm going to utilize a tool called Verify. And I want to verify both of my toolpath operations. And you'll see over here in our operations manager, whenever we do back plot or verify, we're only going to simulate what's currently selected. So right now, I only have contour selected. There's a check mark next to that specific toolpath operation. But I also want to simulate the face mill uh, while we're using verify. And I want to see that check mark next to face mill as well as contour before I start that. So an easy way to do this is actually to select on toolpath group one. It's going to select on everything in our operations manager underneath that toolpath group. And we can actually see both of those toolpaths get highlighted or generated out here in the viewport. So as long as you have both of these toolpaths highlighted or selected and we have a check mark next to each one of them, we can go up here to the top of the window and then right next to our that back plot selected operations icon is, so those four little waves, there's an icon to the right of it called verify selected operations. And it kind of looks like a little half pipe. And my joke here is you're going to hit that half pipe to try to jump over these waves or the river or the ocean or the lake. So go ahead and select on the verify selected operations. Again, it's that half pipe looking icon. And this is going to open up a separate window for us, which is going to be specific to the Verify tool. And this is why it's important that we set up our stock material while we're doing the machine group setup, because right here is our mesh file. And as we hit play, we can actually see this material get removed from each one of our toolpath operations. So let's go ahead and hit play down here. And we can see that the face mill travels across the top, and then we have that end mill traveling around with the contour. However, this might be a little bit confusing because both of these toolpath operations are represented in yellow. So up here in the top left of these tabs, we're going to look for the Verify tab. So click on Verify, and inside of Verify, we're going to look for Color Loop. So when we click on color loop, we can actually see each one of these toolpaths represented in a different color. Likewise, I want to slow this down a little bit and really get an appreciation for how these tools are operating. So I'm going to go ahead from this bottom right here, uh, move the slider over here to slow, and then I'll rewind this, and then I'll go ahead and hit play. 
So we can see that we have two passes with that face mill, and then we're going to make two passes with that contour mill. So that looks pretty good. I'm cleaning up on all of my edges. I'm getting a really good representation of what's truly being removed, and I'm feeling confident and comfortable to go ahead and move into my next tool path. So let's go ahead and back out of Verify. And again, this is a completely separate window from Mastercam, so don't accidentally close down your Mastercam session. We only want to make sure that we're closing out of the Verify window. So we're going to go up here to the top right, close out of the Verify window, and return back to our main Mastercam session. And we've already completed this face mill as well as this contour, so I'm feeling good that we can go ahead and move into some of these holes, and we're just going to use a drilling operation to open those up. So over here in the top left, we're going to find our 2D gallery again. We can either hit the drop down menu or choose from that top row the drill operation. So we'll click drill, and this is a pretty nice feature. All we need to do is select each one of these holes or the outside edges of these contours. So we'll select one, two, three, and four. And Mastercam gives us pretty good feedback here. It's actually going to tell us the size of each one of those holes so we know what drill we need to choose while we're going through the uh, tool operation. So we have a 400 size hole, a 250 size hole, 400 size hole, and then another 250 size hole. Now I want to hit each one of these holes with the same drill and I'm going to use the smallest drill available, so that's going to be the 250 size drill. And then I'm going to use a end mill to open up these 400 size holes because I typically probably wouldn't have a 400 size on size drill. It'd probably be like 406 or maybe like 3906. You're probably not going to get 400 exactly. So I'll hit the green check mark. I'm going to move here into our parameters. Uh, I'll jump down here into tools. We currently have no drills active in this tool library. So I'm going to select my tool library, and inside a tool library, there's quite a bit of drills that are here in that default library. So just keep scrolling down and use this diameter column to look for the correct uh, de decimal dimension. We're going to look for 250. And we can see here we have a quarter inch drill, 250 size. It's tool number 124. We'll hit the green check mark. We make sure that we select up here in the tool library, and we're going to leave a note here. I'm going to do 250 drill. We'll jump down here into holders, nothing has to change there. Same thing with stock, nothing has to change. Cut parameters, um, we do have the ability to do different drilling operations. So if I hit the drop down menu and if I'm doing like really deep cuts, I could probably do a peck drill. However, this is pretty shallow. Uh, this shoulder is only about 375 thousandths. So I think I can just go straight through and just do this drill counter bore. Again, nothing in tool axis, nothing in limits, nothing in hole segments, but here in linking parameters, we do want to make sure that we are set up for absolute, absolute, and absolute. Um, I do like using the clearance option, especially when we're using drills, because we have a long drill tip sticking out of that holder. So I'm going to go ahead and click on clearance. Five inch is a little bit too much for me. I'm going to change this over to absolute, and I'm going to change this five inch here to two. Likewise, I'm going to go over here to the top of stock, just make sure that we are choosing zero. And the depth, we're going to go all the way down to this bottom edge of that shoulder. Now, you can do this in one of two ways. You can either do the math yourself and say, hey, I want to go a little bit um, further down. Or I think the better practice is actually to come down here into tip comp. And we're going to turn that tip comp on. And this, uh, you have to know what your angle is of that drill. So for us, we have a 130 angle drill. So I can go ahead and change this to 130 degrees. And the breakthrough amount is going to be roughly like 60 thousandths or an eighth. So you're just going a little bit below. And all this is saying is, yes, I set up that 375 as the bottom of that uh, stock or the depth of that drill. But we're going to go past that just a little bit um, based on the angle so you don't have to do any trig. And we're going to go about 60 thousandths past it. Like I said, you could do it one of two ways. You can either set it up here in the tip comp. I think this is a little bit better, especially if you're doing shoulder depths. But this is a through hole drill. Um, so you could, in theory, go here in the linky parameters and just change the depth there and make it go maybe like a half inch or something. Either way, um, we're going to be fine. We'll go ahead and hit the green check mark. And we can see our drill represented out there. So let's go ahead and see what this looks like and verify once again. We'll just kind of repeat our practices. We'll click on our toolpath group one, select all these operations. We're going to click on that half pipe looking icon, verify uh, selected operations. This is going to open up that separate window for us. And we'll go ahead and hit play. So we did our face mill, we did our contour, and now we're doing all four of those holes. So I'll back out of that and we can go ahead and move into our next toolpath. 
So like I said before, we hit each one of these holes with the smallest drill available, which is going to be that 250 size drill. And then we have two oversized holes that are currently set at 400 thousandths that need to be opened up. Now, we're going to have to use an end mill or what's called a circle mill operation because we don't have a 400 exact size drill available to us. So over here in the top left, we're going to go to our 2D gallery and we're actually going to need to expand this out because it's not available on this top row. So we'll hit expand gallery and we're going to look for this circle mill option underneath hole making. So we'll click on circle mill and this is going to operate exactly like the drill feature was. So we're just going to have to select on the two oversized holes so that they both get selected. Again, I can see that the diameter of each one of those is 400 thousandths. We'll go ahead and hit the green check mark for OK and move into our parameters window. OK, so we'll come down here into our tool. Uh, the only end mill that we currently have in our tool library is going to be that 5 8 flat end mill. And that's going to be a little bit too big for these holes because 5 8 is 625. These holes are going to be 400. So we need to add a smaller end mill here into our tool library. So we'll click on select tool library and let's look for something like 312, so 5 16 so we'll scroll down here and we're going to find the 286 tool, which is going to be the 5 8, or sorry, 5 16 flat end mill. You can see that the diameter there is 0.312. Hit the green check mark. And then in our comment, we'll go ahead and say 0.312 flat end mill. And then we'll just put a note here for circle mill. Okay. So again, nothing really has to change in holder. Stock can be the same. Cut parameters. I really like this page, especially when we use the circle mill, because with the drill size, we're only going to get what that actual drill is in diameter. However, when we're using the end mill, we can actually override the geometry of the hole that we selected. So for example, if I want to make this 400,000 side hole just a little bit bigger, I can click override geometry diameter. And I can change this to 0.401. So this is going to be 1,000th larger or oversized. And you can make this for like hole features that are going to line up to pins. It's really convenient. Down here for the stock to leave on the walls and the floor, we're going to change this to zero as well as zero. And then I like to use roughing over finishing. Um, I think that the roughing just plays a little nicer in Mastercam than the finishing operation. Uh, so we're just going to come here into roughing. We're going to turn that on and we're going to leave it stock. We're going to keep moving our way down. We're going to skip finishing. We're going to skip the transitions. Here in depth cut, I'm going to try to go to like half the size of the diameter of the tool for each one of these depth cuts. So I'm going to turn my depth cut on. And this is a 312. And I can use this as a calculator. I can say 0.3125 divided by 2. Hit enter. And I'm going to get 0.15625. So I'm going down 156 thousandths each time I make a cut here. And like we learned before, we just want to keep our tool down. Breakthrough, nothing uh, really has to change in there. Tool axis control, we're just going to keep moving all the way down until we see our linking parameters. So again, here in linking parameters, we can change everything to absolute, 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 and absolute. Top of stock is going to be zero. Depth, we're just going to go a little bit below the surface. So I can click depth, click on this edge here, and we have 0.375 for that entire shoulder. So let's go a little bit lower than that. We can either go like a half inch or 7 16 So I'm just going to say like negative 0.5. And then we can go ahead and hit the green check mark. All right. So we can see there that the circle mill is actually going in each one of these depth cuts. So every time that you see a blue line, that's the depth cut that it went down. So it's going 156 thousandths down, 156 thousandths down, so on and so forth. This green line is actually the helical motion. So it's going to rotate into the part and it's going to cut down in X, Y, and Z, kind of like in a spiral fashion, which takes a lot of cutting pressure off of the tool and allows it uh, for a nice clean cut. So let's take a look at this tool path, the circle mill using back plot to see how the tool enters with that helical motion and then travels to each one of these depth cuts. So over here in the operations manager, make sure you have circle mill selected. We're going to go to the top of the window, find the four little waves for back plot selected operations. We'll click on that. And I'm going to hit play here from the top left. And I'm going to take that slider and I'm going to move it all the way over until I see the tool enter that hole and then move it back a little bit. So we're going to have that tool enter. We can see it helical down, take a cut at 156, helical down, take a cut at 312, so on and so forth. 
And this really takes advantage of the fact that we pre-drilled this hole and we don't have to cut into solid material. There's actually material removed and we can just cut with the shoulder of the tool as opposed to the entire diameter of the tool as we're helicaling down. So again, the best of both worlds, pre-drill and then we'll open it up to the true size using circle mill. So let's go ahead and back out a back plot. I'm gonna hit the green check mark from this window. And now I wanna check against my entire toolpath group one and make sure that the toolpath and verify matches the 3D model that we imported from SOLIDWORKS. So over here on the left hand side in my operations manager, I'm gonna select my toolpath group one and just make sure that we have a check mark next to each one of our toolpath operations. And then at the top of the window, we're gonna look for that half pipe looking icon for verified selected operations. We'll click on that. It's gonna open up this secondary window for us. I'm gonna zoom out a little bit so that I can see my entire part. And we'll go ahead and hit the play button. So we can see that we did our face mill, the contour mill, and then we did our four drilled holes. And now we're opening it up with that circle mill. So I wanna check this against my 3D model from SOLIDWORKS and this is very easy. All we have to do is be here in the home tab and then we're gonna use this visibility section. And these are going to be three click radio buttons. I'm gonna use the tool as an example. So I'm gonna click on the tool once. We can see that the tool changed to transparent. I'll click on the tool a uh, second time. We actually remove the tool. And if I click on the tool a third time, it'll bring it back into verify. So I'm gonna turn my tool off here, but I wanna focus on this workpiece. So I'm gonna click on the workpiece once. And this workpiece is going to be that 3D model that we brought in from SOLIDWORKS. So if I click on it a second time, I can make it transparent. And I can actually see, I'm gonna zoom in here, that there's no difference from the stock model that we're cutting here in Verify against that work piece that we brought in from th uh, SOLIDWORKS. So right now the holes match up, the edges of the contour matches up, that top base matches up. So I'm feeling pretty good about this and we can go ahead and move forward and start doing some finishing operations which are going to include the outside uh, chamfered edge. We're gonna chamfer some of these holes and we're actually gonna add some text here uh, so that the operator knows what the part name is when they're picking it up. So I'm gonna change my visibility back to the default options here. I'm gonna turn my tool back on. I'm gonna turn my workpiece off. And then I'm gonna close out of Verify and we can go ahead and move into some of those finishing operations. So let's start by adding a chamfer to the outside edge of our 3D model. And that way no one accidentally cuts themselves while handling this part. So we'll go over to the top left in our 2D gallery. We're gonna to need to expand out this menu again. So hit the drop down arrow and we're gonna look for an icon called Model Chamfer. And that's gonna be located here underneath milling. It's gonna be in the third row and the third icon over. So we'll find Model Chamfer, we'll click on that. And that's going to open up our parameters window. Now, I don't know why by default, it just doesn't have you start uh, selecting chain geometry because you do need to have geometry selected before you can apply this toolpath. So here inside this toolpath type, go over here to the right and you'll find chain geometry. We'll select on this little mouse button here to select the chains and it'll open up our chaining window for us. And you'll notice that we can only select the solids or the 3D models. If you are trying to chain a uh, wireframe or a 2D piece of geometry for a chamfer, you will need to use the contour toolpath and make some changes in your parameters there. However, here inside of the uh, model chamfer, you can only select those 3D uh, models or the solids themselves. So we have to select on these edges of this part here. And I wanna show you a bad example really quick. Uh, just make sure that you do not have your faces selected, but if you do, and you select this face here, you'll notice that it'll pick up all these holes. And while you can uh, do a chamfer mill on these holes, I think it will start to interfere with your lead in and lead out. So I am going to deselect this and turn off my face and I will only select the loop so we can do the outside edge and then we'll come back with a separate toolpath called chamfer drill to open up these holes uh, for those chamfers. So this is gonna operate exactly like the 2D contour toolpath that we were looking at earlier. As long as you have the loop selected, we're gonna go to the top base and the outside edge and we're gonna make sure that we're going in a clockwise fashion. So go near the bottom of this edge here and we'll click once and we can see that the arrow is going clockwise which is going to be a climb cut. So we'll hit the green check mark and then again, you can see your chain geometry there. We have that one loop located underneath that. So we'll go down here into our tool and we'll see that we do not have a chamfer mill available to us. So we're gonna have to populate that into our tool library. So we'll click on the select tool library. As we've talked about before, Mastercam is smart enough to recognize that we are trying to do this model chamfer command. So it's going to filter out all of the chamfer tools that we have available to us. So we're gonna look for the half inch chamfer and this is going to be the uh, th uh, 319th tool. We'll hit the green check mark, and then we're going to leave a comment here for chamfer outside edge. All right, 
We don't have to make any changes for our holder. Our crop parameter uh, on this left-hand side, this is completely fine. However, on the right side, this chamfer width allows us to control the actual size of the chamfer. So the chamfer width, we're going to make this 15 thousandths, so make this 0 0.015. And then the bottom offset is really going to depend on your work holding and how far you are above the vise or other features, as well as the specific tool that you're using. Um, you could change this to zero. You might leave like a little burr at the bottom. Uh, so you probably want to go a little bit below the edge of this uh, chamfer width. So I can leave this at 50 thousandths. That's completely fine for this uh, example. Depth cuts, we don't have to make any changes. Lead in, lead out, we do want to have this on because we do want to lead in. And then as it comes out, we want to have that roll out as well. And like I said, this might interfere if you have the hole selected. Uh, so just be careful of that. Don't have to do anything with multi-passes. Linking parameter, we can leave this all the same because there's no options to do absolute, absolute, absolute. So at this point, we can go ahead and hit the green check mark. Okay, so we can see that toolpath get generated. Like I said, we're leading in. We're going to go around the outside edge, and then we're going to go ahead and lead out. So let's take a look at the next toolpath, which is going to be that chamfer drill, so that we can edge break some of these holes without having to worry about a lead in and lead out. So over here in the top left in our 2D gallery, we're going to have to expand out this menu once again, so hit the drop down arrow. And we're going to look for an icon called chamfer drill, and that's going to be located here underneath hole making. It's going to be in the first row, second icon over, so we'll click on chamfer drill. And then this is going to operate like any of those hole making or drill making features. So I want you to click on the top edges of each one of these holes uh, because that's exactly where the chamfer is going to be applied. So if you click on the bottom edge, it's going to drive that uh, drill all the way down and you're going to crash your tool. Um, so we can see here that we have two 400 size holes and then two 250 size holes. And this is going to be important because when we are choosing that spot drill to apply this feature, uh, we can't be smaller than that 400 size hole. We have to be a little bit bigger so that we can cut it with the edge of that tool. So just keep that in mind. We'll hit the green check mark. And then from here in our parameters window, we're going to jump down here to tool. Uh, sometimes this happens. This is an error. I think it's just like a little glitch. It just says unsupported tool. We'll hit OK. It's going to bring you right here into our tool library. Uh, we do not have a spot drill currently active here in our tool library, so we're going to have to add that. So select tool library. We're going to go over here and find a tool that's bigger than that 400 size hole. So we can find that half inch spot drill. So that's going to be tool number 24. Hit the green check mark. And then here in the comment, we can just say chamfer drill. All right. We don't have to make any changes for the holder or the stock. But in the cut parameters, this is going to operate a lot like the uh, model chamfer feature that we were just doing. And the depth we have to apply is going to be the actual depth of that chamfer. So we're going to have to change this to 0 0.015. Uh, we don't have to make any changes here to the dwell. Um, we can jump down here into tool axis. No changes there. No changes in limit. No changes in whole segment. Here in linking parameters, we do want to change this to absolute, absolute. And then we don't have the option to choose absolute because that top of stock is going to be that uh, top edge selection that we were doing uh, earlier. Um, we do probably want to change this clearance height. Um, as I've said before, five inches could be just a little too much. So I'm just going to change this to two inches. And then we should be ready to hit the green check mark. So hit the green check mark here. And the thing that I really like about the chamfer drill feature is that it does all the trigonometry for you. So even though that we selected a 400 size hole with a 250 size hole, it's just going to plunge that drill deeper for the 400 and then plunge the drill shallower for the 250. That way we can maintain the same depth of 15 thousandths for both chamfers. So why don't we take a look at all of our toolpath here and verify and make sure that our chamfer for the drill as well as the uh, model on the edge here are working the way that we want it to. So over here on the left hand side in our operations manager, we'll select our entire toolpath group one. Just make sure that we have a check mark next to each one of our toolpaths. And then at the top of the window, we're going to find that half pipe looking icon, which is going to be the verify selected operations. And that's going to open up that secondary window for you. So let's let this play out. I'll go down here and hit play. And then I'm just going to move my part around so that we can see. And I'm going to pause this right about here. And I'll slow this down so that I can see the chamfer mill run around the outside of the edge. And then we can see the chamfer drill hit each one of these holes. So I slowed it down. I'll hit play. OK, so that we ran around. And then we hit each one of those holes. So that looked pretty good. Uh, so as far as first operation goes, this looks like it's almost done. The only thing that I want to add before we're finished is just some text here on the back side so that the operator knows what part they're holding. So let's go ahead and back out of verify and look at that text feature. Now, adding text in Mastercam can be a little bit difficult sometimes because you have to create a separate wireframe level to include that text to be used as toolpath for your engraving operation. 
So now might be a pretty good time for us to start cleaning up our viewport or our workspace here because we currently have all of our toolpath operations active or visible. And if you have a bunch of different toolpaths active or visible, it can start to look like a bird's nest sometimes where you have all these overlapping lines and it'll be difficult for us to center that text on the back of this part or wherever you're trying to put that text. So let's go ahead and try toggling this off or turning this off. So over here on the left hand side in our operations manager, we currently have all of our toolpaths selected from the verify before. So if you go up here to the machine group and right above machine group, there's an icon called toggle display selected operations. It's going to be these three little waves. If you click on those three little waves, as long as all of these toolpaths are selected, you can actually toggle them off or turn them off. Now they're still active, they're still here in our operations manager, however we're just not seeing it out in the viewport or our workspace. Next we're going to jump down into our levels tab and we're going to add that level for that text. So go down here to the bottom left, we're currently inside of toolpaths, we're going to jump all the way over here to levels, and just like what we did before, we're just going to hit the green plus button to add that new level in here. So we'll go up to the top left of this window, click the green plus button to add that new level, and then I'm going to title this level here, text. So just make sure that you are currently working on that level, that you have a check mark next to text, and that you're not going to put your text here on the wireframe level. From here, we're going to jump into our wireframe tab. So up here in the top ribbon, we're currently sitting in the toolpaths tab. We're going to move all the way over here to the left until we see wireframe. We'll click on wireframe, and we're going to look for an icon called create letters. It has a big letter A above it, and it's actually right next to the bounding box that we were using earlier. So find create letters. We'll go ahead and select on that and it's going to open up this Create Letters Properties box over here on the left. Now, whenever I create letters, I just want to make sure that I'm parallel to the part, um, just so that I can try and center it or see what the letters will look like when it's going to be centered. So right-click here in the viewport, anywhere in the free space, and we're just going to reorientate ourselves to that top plane. So we have the part centered here on the screen. Um, over here on the left in the Create Letters property box, um, go ahead and check your style. If you hit the drop-down menu for style, I like using the OLF Simple Sans CJK OC. Um, this is just going to be basic, simple uh, stick lettering. I'm, I've used this number of times. It's very useful. So click on that. And then there are letters here. Just make sure that you're typing in caps locks. Um, we're going to uh, say that this is going to be the Soft Riser A-1. And right now the text is a little bit too big. It's set to 1 inch for height. But let's go ahead and change this to 0.1875. And then when you change that, you'll notice that the text is now attached to your mouse. So if I want to, I can try and center this. However, I like to make sure that like I'm right on the center of the origin here. So I'm actually going to zoom out a little bit and drop my letter on the outside of the part. And when I drop that, I'll hit the green check mark and I can go ahead and try and move this and center it in between these two points. Now, this should be relatively easy as long as we can select our entire soft riser A-1 geometry using a single bounding box. And this is the reason why I moved the text outside of the part, so I'm not accidentally clicking on the part or any of the wireframe geometry that we set up for the stock model. So I'm going to move my mouse to the top left of the soft riser A-1, and I'm going to click, hold, and drag a box over this uh, text selection. So click, hold, and drag a box. And then once you have a box over this, I'm going to click for the second time, and that's going to highlight everything there inside of that box. So I have my soft riser A-1, all of that geometry, now highlighted in yellow. And if you look over here on the left-hand side in our levels, you could actually see on that text level, we have 50 different entities. So if I had to click this one by one, it'd be kind of a pain in the butt. So now that this is all highlighted, we're actually going to open up the secondary uh, tab up here in the ribbon bar, and we actually have tools for the wireframe selection. And inside of tools, we're going to look for that dynamic movement. So click on dynamic movement, and when you click on dynamic movement, it's going to put a gnomon attached to your mouse, just like how we did for our planes. And this allows you to move your selection dynamically uh, from a certain point or a certain piece of geometry. So we're going to try to move this here from the datum or the center point of that soft riser A-1. And there's going to be a little BMW symbol on top of the I, and that's going to be that center point of the entire text. So we'll click on that little uh, datum point there. We'll click once. And then when we click once, it's going to drop the gnomon on top of that datum. And then we're going to click on the gray ball, or if your mouse is over it, it's going to turn yellow. So we'll click on that. And now that allows us to move this text dynamically from the center of that datum. So all we want to do now is we want to move this or move our mouse all the way over here to the top left of the wireframe. And we're going to wake up that corner at the top left. And we're not going to click on anything. We're just going to uh, leave our mouse there. 
and then we're going to move our mouse all the way down here to the bottom right and you can see when we move our mouse over one of these corners we're actually waking them up and putting like a temporary uh, endpoint there which is that green little plus button and then when you wake two points up it'll actually tell you where the center of those two points are and that's going to be represented here in the center of our part which is going to be that red uh, plus and I'm just going to move my mouse over here to the red plus and I'll drop my soft riser a-1 text on that plus and now I'll hit the green check mark and it's going to center that text perfectly in the middle of our part so let's go ahead and try using that as the center point of our toolpath uh, for the engraving operation. So I'm going to move here from the wireframe tab all the way over here to the right to the toolpaths tab. So inside of toolpaths, we're just going to use the simple contour 2D. And I know if you hit the drop down menu and expand out our menu here, there is an option for engrave, but I don't like using this as much. I usually just use the contour toolpath. So we'll click on contour right here. And this is going to open up our wireframe chaining. And we could try to chain this one by one using the chain option here. We just have to click through these letters. However, I'm not sure if I'm clicking on every single letter. And if you have a whole lot of text, this is going to be a whole lot of clicking. So I'm going to deselect those selections there. And I'm just going to click on the window selection. So again, we're going to be here in the wireframe selection. We're going to click on window. And just like what we did for the movement of that uh, text using the dynamic command, we're just going to drag a box over the soft riser A-1 and we'll click again down here and now it's just asking me for an approximate start point. So after I've selected everything here with that bounding box, I just have to tell Mastercam where that start point is going to be for that toolpath. So I'm going to click on the bottom corner of this S and you'll see that it's going to highlight all of that text and tell me exactly the direction that it needs to travel um, under that selection. So we'll hit the green check mark and that's going to open up the parameters window. So let's just go over here to tool and we're going to find an engraving tool. Right now we don't have an engraving tool active in our tool library. So I'm going to come down here to select tool library. By default, this is probably going to drive you to look for a flat end mill, especially if you're using the 2D contour. So we're going to have to come over here to filter and we'll go click on filter and we'll have to deselect that flat end mill and actually come down here to the fourth row, third icon over for the engraving tool. So click on the engraving tool, we'll hit the green check mark, and we're just going to find any quarter inch uh, engraver that's going to be available to us. So it looks like there's a 374 tool there, uh, quarter inch engraver, we'll click on that, we'll hit the green check mark, and then we'll just go ahead and leave a comment here and say that we're doing a text engrave. All right, then we're going to jump down here into the holder, we don't have to change anything, cut parameters. This is something that's going to be very important while we're trying to do text uh, while using the 2D contour. So typically if you're doing a 2D contour, you would want to leave your cutter compensation on whether you're doing like left or right for G41 or G42. However, if you're doing text engraving, you want to make sure that you set the compensation type to off. So we're going to hit this drop down menu for computer and then we're going to change this to off and you'll see that the line or the arrow that's traveling around the tool is now at the center of the tool and that's because we're trying to program to this, uh, the tip of that engraver and we're not trying to offset it from its diameter so we do have a quarter inch uh, diameter engraver but it's going to a tip and we want to be programming from that tip so we'll move down here into depth cuts and this is on by default because our last 2D contour did have multiple depth cuts uh, so I just want to turn that off because I don't want to be running multiple depths with my engraving tool We'll jump down here into lead in, lead out. This is something that's very important while we're doing engraving. We do not want to have this turned on because it's actually going to gouge the part as it enters each letter. So I'm going to turn this off. If you hit the green check mark and you have lead in, lead out uh, turned on, you're actually going to see a bunch of um, lines that are going to be entering and exiting each one of the letters. So we'll keep coming down here until we see linking parameters. So we'll go down here into linking parameters. We'll just set this to absolute, 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 and then absolute. Top of stock, we can just change this to zero because that's the surface of the part. And the depth, uh, since we don't have 3D geometry to um, pick from, I'm just going to say that this is going to go like 10 thousandths below that surface. So I'm going to go negative 0 0.01. And then we can go ahead and hit the green check mark. So you can see that we have nice um, toolpath going to each one of these letters. And let's see how this looks uh, when we open it up and verify. So go over here to the left hand side in our operations manager. We'll select our entire toolpath group so everything is selected. At the top of the window, we're going to look for that half pipe looking icon, which is going to be verify select operations. That's going to open up that separate window for us. And then you can see that soft riser A-1 there in the wireframe. If we did want to turn that off, we can come up here into that visibility section. And we can just turn off our wireframe from there. 
And then I'm going to let this play out. And we can see that as we go around and we come there to the center, we get that soft riser A-1. I'm going to toggle my tool off. And that's now engraved 10 thousandths below that surface. So at this point, I would say that we're completely done with this part. We've done everything that we need to to prepare this for second operation. Uh, and that the operator is going to know exactly what the uh, part name is, and they're not going to cut themselves on any of these corners. So I'm going to back out a back plot. And we can save this part, but that's going to be the end of the video. Um, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one. Bye.